Okay, our next presenter is Jack Oman, and this is what Jack handed me two minutes ago. Jack is your very good friend. He was a finalist for the 2012 Pulitzer Prize. Welcome, Jack. She wanted short but sweet, so. How many of you are cartoonists? How many of you are real people? Oh, okay, from Oregon? Great, okay, so I'm gonna make this super arcane so all the real people can leave. Um, because we've had a lot of speeches up here that are, you know, not arcane. Um, but I did wanna have a frank talk with conversations, or, excuse me, I was up until three last night, so um, I wanted to have a frank talk about style and what it means to a cartoonist, and so a lot of you are not going to be hip to this conversation. Um, but there are a couple things I want to say about it first before I do my PowerPoint. Um, I started in cartooning in 1980 in syndication, and that's 32 years. And I saw a lot of guys here at this convention uh, who I met. My first convention was 25 years ago. And Dwayne Powell is here, and Mike Peters is here, and um, Tom Tolls, and Joel Pett, and you know, people who kind of either came into the business right before me or came in at the same time. And we were all driven, a lot of us, by either, I mean, the Herb Block generation is pretty much out of the business now. Um, and so the McNelly generation essentially is now ahead of the wave. And interestingly, there's no buddy behind us in a lot of ways in terms of the archetype of our style. And when I talk about our style, I'm talking about the Oliphant McNelly archetype. So what do I mean by that? It is a essentially a single panel, one person saying something to another person, or something very bold. And when I first got into cartooning in uh, 1978, um, I remember when I got interested in political cartoons, it's kind of a f weird to think this now. Um, I remember being in 10th grade and looking at cartoons in Time and Newsweek, and at the time I wanted to be um, President of the United States. Um, that's why I've been wearing the suit around Washington this week. Um, but I wanted to show you that I actually did wear a pair of, you know, have jeans. Um, and the notion that I thought of political cartooning as my fallback position when I was in 10th grade, uh, to me, is unbelievable. I mean, you have a much better chance of getting elected to the United States Senate, statistically, than you do, I mean, there are 100 jobs in the U.S. Senate <laughs> with dental plans. I mean, how many are there in cartooning now? I mean, how many are there now, Joel? 50? There aren't two in every state. I mean, California now has one full-time editorial cartoonist. They have 52 electoral votes. They have one full-time, I think that's right, okay? And, you know, that's appalling. Um, I don't know how we got here. I don't know why editors can't see that, you know, we're worth it. And, and I guess one thing I'd like to see coming out of this convention is us to go back and say we're worth it. You know, let's fight. And I don't know if we've been fighting enough. I don't know if we've been making the case strong enough with our editors. You know, um, I think a lot of, when I first, that's right. <laughs> when you first start off, when I first started off in cartooning, you know, you had Oliphant and you had Peters and you had Marlette and you had, uh, you know, Dwayne and you had all these guys who were just super talents. And it was, 
you know, an honor just to like even breathe the same air with these guys when we came to the convention. And, um, and, and now we have, uh, you know, a situation where, you know, we can't even, it was so obvious to editors of the generation that hired us that cartooning mattered. And I'm still marveling at the fact that here we are moving into this kind of, you know, visual world, you know, and we, we can't make the sale. And so what I've tried to do in the last couple of years is break out of that archetype. Um, and it was hard because I know a lot of you, uh, how many, you know, I was the, the quintessential McNelly clone. Um, and when I got into cartooning, I had just kind of forgotten about all my creative influences. And I had them. And it's really hard for me to believe that I basically chucked all my early creative influences out the window to plug myself into this archetype of drawing like McNelly. And I mean, obviously, this is a hard thing for me to say. It's easier for me to say it 32 years later. I mean, Christ, I even pretended to be conservative, you know? Um, I mean, some of you may remember that. I mean, I read, you know, uh, Jude Winiski's The Way Things Work in 1980, and I thought, huh, plausible. He, he, he wrote this uh, book, and he did it on a, you know, a laugher curve on a napkin, and, uh, you know, this could work. And so, you know, it didn't. Um, and then, you know, I kind of went back to where I was. And as I went through my career, I had the, basically the freedom to go back to who I was. And who I was in 1976 was somebody who read The New Yorker all the time. And I'd almost forgotten about that. And I was really into uh, James Thurber and um, E.B. White. And I probably have never talked about this with any of you guys, but... You know, I started thinking about what really motivated me creatively. I remember doing these really long um, books, or, you know, comic books, essentially, or essays, illustrated essays, when I was 14, 15 years old. I couldn't find them, unfortunately, for this PowerPoint. Um, but I went back to where I was. And I was thinking, you know, if maybe if we all went back to where we were, that would be a good way to kind of reinvent this profession. Because it needs reinvention um, in a lot of ways. I mean, I've seen a lot of really fascinating presentations. Um, Anne's was just overwhelming. I mean, Anne doesn't like me um, too much, but <laughs> because I'm teasing her all the time. But I'm, maybe she does. And you know, just the notion that she kind of came up with this, I am going to do an animation over uh, a soundtrack to me was like, it's so simple. I mean, it was so simple, and, and it was right there in front of her. And she probably, you know, you just probably got up one night and thought, man, this would be awesome, right? I mean, was it a divine thing, or did it just occur to you, or, you know, uh, don't you don't remember. Well, I'm, I, I think it's brilliant. I mean, uh, and so many of you have been essentially forced into going to animations. Rob's film. Uh, you know, that's brilliant. That's like the cartoon of the future. I mean, I want to do that. I want to do what you're doing. Um, you know, that's inspiring to me, to see somebody, you know, you're an elderly bull like me now, you know, you're one of the kids, 54-year-old kids, right? Uh, and, you know, you, you, you picked up the ball and you changed the game again. And she picked up the ball and changed the game again. And it's inspiring to me. And so I decided uh, about, and Steve Brodner's amazing. I mean, it was an honor to meet him. I don't know if he's here. Um, you know, just his astonishing style. And then being able to, you know, translate it, that into, you know, his, I assume he's going to do these animations. I, I mean, they're just amazing. Um, and, you know, he's, he's, around our age. He's in his 50s, obviously, and he was probably 20 years ago. It's like, man, I'm making 100,000 bucks a year, you know, selling crap to the New Yorker, and it was all good, and then all of a sudden, like, the floor dropped out on everybody. And I was the same way. I made a, I made a ton of money. I mean, I've had my pay cut 40%. Okay? That's a lot. <laughs> okay? 
So, you know, the young McNally guy is now paying the penalty. But, you know, I, what I wanted to do is change. And you know, when you're 48, it's hard to change. And I also wanted to change the PowerPoints today. <laughs> That's what I looked like when I took over McNally's client list, and no wonder everybody hated my guts. Notice I'm not reading the PowerPoint. Doesn't he? I mean, he really does. His name's Chessie. <laughs> yes, I am in a bathroom. In Idaho. <laughs> Oh, okay, here we go. Now, this is one of the, uh, I'm not gonna read any of this. I'm gonna talk about what happened. And I know I'm not the first person who's done a, a first person cartoon before, but I can tell you that I'm probably one of the first people who got my newspaper to go along with it as a regular feature. And it was actually a really easy sell. And my um, uh, editor, Bob Caldwell, who uh, died this year uh, in a way that um, nobody should go out um, at 62. Uh, you can Google it. And he was just the most lovely man. And he really cared about cartoons. And I don't know if any of you have an editor who like really cares about and understands cartoons, but this guy did. And you know, we had long conversations about you know, and very supple conversations that wasn't like, wow, I really like the way this guy draws, but just like, I mean, he was really into Danziger. And any editor who's into Danziger is an editor I want to work for. I mean, even if he isn't here, he's come to some. But, and, you know, Jeff is a good friend of mine. But like, I, you know, I love Danziger's work. And Danziger is somebody who also thought, you know what? It's been done a certain way, and I want to try to do it a different way, and I'm going to give the readers some credit. And it's really exciting to be able to do a feature that gives the readers some credit. And uh, you assume, I mean, at this point, you know, who's reading the paper? I mean, it's people with master's degrees. I mean, you know, look at the demo. It's people in their late 50s who are quite highly educated. And so, you know, you don't have to do the labeled, symboled cartoon anymore. I mean, we can go there. You know, they're smart. So, you know, a lot of them are smarter than we are. And, uh, you know, would have jobs if they lost them. You know, <laughs> they could get other jobs. Uh, and so I, I try to give these folks some credit. And I'll also tell you another influence. Uh, is Matt Bors, and Matt Bors live in the, lives in Portland. And I have to tell you that the happiest day of my career was, uh, number one, finding out that Worker 
won the Pulitzer, which to me was a ratification that this system now works again, and B, to, to share the, 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 uh, the honor of being a finalist with, with Matt Worker and Matt Bors, who to me is like my mentor. The guy's tw 28 years old, isn't he? 29, or you, he's probably not even out of bed yet. But I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, and I'll show up for his event. But, but he, you know, to, to have somebody who's 28 or 29 years old that you can learn from is, is awesome. I mean, it's like, you know, I look to my peers for inspiration. Um, I, I, you know, I'm very close to a lot of you guys. I really make an effort to kind of, you know, stay in touch with people on Facebook and call them and that sort of thing. And, you know, and I don't, I don't just call you up to, you know, talk about, um, you know, my social life, which is quite dramatic. Um, but, you know, to call, and we talk about style all the time. And it's important to keep doing that, but it's also important to talk to people outside of your profession who are doing something different. You know, I love to talk to writers. I mean, I think of myself now as a, as a writing cartoonist. And, and it's hard, you know, to describe, but every, the outside world, you know, I'm sure that when ABC came in here yesterday, it was all about, you know, you just, they think, the, they say the same goddamn things every time, you know, them damn pictures, and how do you draw Gingrich's hair, and wow, Obama's got big ears, and John Boehner's big blue eyes, and he's so orange, and all this crap, and it's like, it doesn't matter, you know, it does not matter. What matters is, is what we say, and we've got to push that. I mean, Tom Tolles is a what I say cartoonist. Clay Bennett is a what I say cartoonist. You know, Joel Pett is a what I say cartoonist. They're not what I draw cartoonists. I mean, they're excellent artists, you know. Um, I'm sure Joel Pett couldn't do a watercolor to save his goddamn life. <laughs> but, you know, sorry. I mean, come on up here. Come on up here. Just come up for a second, okay? And, you know... So, you know, Joel is like... Can I, can I sit down? Yeah, you can sit down, yeah. <laughs> I just thought it'd be cool for us to do our bit again, you know, while I'm up here. You told me about this. I wasn't, I'm not... <laughs> anyway, it's important to know that. It's important to think about what you say, and I think about what I say. And, you know, yes, I love drawing undersides of highway overpasses. There's no question about that. I mean, I... <laughs> I like to draw, and um, you know I've gotten better at it. And the reason I got better at it was I stopped thinking about how McNelly would draw a cartoon, and I started thinking about how Jack Oman would do a cartoon. And it's important. And um, you know I like to draw. I, I didn't even know I liked to draw outdoor scenes until I started doing this. And so you can establish a mood in a drawing. Um, by just thinking about what you like to draw and not thinking about how others draw it. And I've gotten so much pleasure out of my career in the last four years, I can't tell you. Um, it just, it, in a way, it's changed my life. Because... Oh, why, Horsey draws and, all those boobs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had not noticed that before, Joel, nor has, nor has that ever been commented upon in the profession. I, I don't know what you're talking about. But here's your microphone. Here. Oh, thank yeah. you. So... Oh, sorry, I just... I also decided that I would go not only in the political cartooning direction, I would also really seriously pursue my writing. And... Um, <laughs> and this has caused me to also think um, more about how I do my cartoons, and so I decided I'm going to start writing real book, 60,000 word essay books, instead of like, I'm trying to think of a cartoon book. How can I think of another cartoon book? When I thought, okay, how can I get away from the conventional thinking creatively? It just opened up my mind in every way and, and improved my own political cartooning work.
You know, when he did that last, God, you know, who do I love more than Mike Peters? But like, I don't love him that much. But like, um, I was like, how, Joel, how long have you and I known each other? 25 years? Have I ever gone up to you and just said, hey, sweetheart, I'm grabbing your crotch. How are you? I mean, as a greeting? No. It's worth a try. I'm still course. waiting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're in our 50s. What's to grab? Hell. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've really enjoyed by look, about looking at graphic novels is just thinking about different perspectives and how you, you view a picture. And I, I'm not advertising myself as the world's greatest illustrator. It's hard for me. I know a lot of people are real naturals. And, um, but I found that I was you know, good enough to pull off some things that I thought I couldn't pull off. And it was, you know, Rex and I used to talk about, he'd always say, loosen up your wing nut. And I know now what he meant, which is like, stop thinking linearly, you know, just open up your head to some different way of doing things. And, you know, that means, I mean, have, you know, for example, I decided, you know, I'm going to send an email to these bastards at Nike. Um, I don't know if any of you have been following this or not, but I went after Nike and the Joe Paterno Child Development Center that they had at their world headquarters several miles from my house, and I basically went after them, you know, nonstop for several months until they got the name changed. And, um, you know, I, I would send, like, f emails to them. I mean, I was acting as I, what I thought was a serious journalist, and that was another way I was able to kind of loosen my wing nut up, was I thought, you know what? I've heard a lot of cartoonists over the years say, we are not taken seriously. We don't, nobody's taken us seriously. Well, I can tell you now that when some, I call somebody in Portland, Oregon, and I tell them I'm working on a Sunday piece, well, they sure as hell return my phone calls now. <laughs> because they're scared. Because they know that, like, they're either going to get made fun of or I'm on the job with them. And imagine, you know, a reporter who could just rip your head off with the cartoon. I mean, it is a truly frightening prospect for them. Uh, and that feels good. I mean, that empowers me and makes me feel stronger as an artist and a cartoonist. You're not going to be able to read any of this, but I'll just... But you can start calling people in Portland and saying, this is Jack Oman. <laughs> yeah. Right. If I hadn't dated them, they'll return my call. <laughs> Jack Oman, you, you owe me money. Oh, and another thing I, I really liked doing was talk about memes. Um, you know, I, Rex and I also were very into doing local cartoons, and so I do three local cartoons a week now. And I'm always looking for that, something that people can hang on to, you know, like uh, some sort of, you know, talk about an avatar. I turned this wolf in Oregon, and, uh, which is called OR7. It's like the most famous wolf in the United States now. Um, and people are really into this wolf. And so I've just like, I will put OR7 in all... Any cartoon I think I can get OR7 into. And it like breaks all the rules and everybody loves it. It's like, where's OR7 today? You know? And it could be a cartoon about the city council or it could be a cartoon about, you know, completely unrelated. But what you do is you surprise them, you know? And then they start looking for this. And, um, you know, that's a very cool thing to do. Um, and this is something I never would have done before 2008 when I started doing this. Um, and I'll. I don't put myself into the cartoon too much, but I, sometimes I will. And, you know, I love being able to refer back to my childhood in my work, which is also this kind of bizarre vein of, of material and metaphors that I can go back to. And that's like our actual Zenith television set in 1963. And, and uh, boy, I blew Obama's mouth on that caricature. But anyway... Um, and it kind of, you know, I can do a joke about the Nixon-Humphrey race. You know, and who cares, right? But, I mean, people in their 50s think it's funny. That's who's reading the paper anyway, you know. <laughs> um, and I love being able to, like, take a theme 
and build off the one theme. Um, and Rob does that really well. A lot of you do it really well. I mean, I'm in awe of all of you. It's, it's very difficult work. Um, but it's fun to just do something that is not that one panel or the president sitting at his desk or the, you know, the, the congressional dome saying something. Um, this is when, this is my fa favorite thing that's happened to me in my cartooning career was that I met Richard Nixon's brother. <laughs> and um, I, this was a couple months ago and he was uh, sitting in a church in Portland where Douglas Brinkley, the historian, was giving a speech. And I looked at him and I thought, God damn it, that guy looks just like Richard Nixon. And I mean, you know, anybody who really knows me knows that Nixon is kind of my other hobby. And, um, and I, I just, I couldn't get it out of my head that this guy must be somehow, like, related to Nixon. And so I went over to him and I said, excuse me, are you Ed Nixon? Because I knew he was still alive. And he lived in Seattle and he's, yes, I am. And he sounds like, just like him and he's just <laughs> like this. And so we shake hands and he said, <laughs> he said, you know, you look a lot like Jack Kennedy. <laughs> So I immediately I said, well, we should have a debate. It would be... <laughs> and I thought about all you guys. So I had him saying, you're no Jack Oman. You know. And of course, this is too busy. And I like to take these things, and I mean, I, I don't... This is wordy, but I think your reader will stick with it if you vary the lettering. I'm also kind of a student of lettering, and I like to do you know, a lot of different types of lettering. I think your readers will get hypnotized by the same lettering over and over and over, and so I'm always screwing around with new fonts. Um, and another thing I've done uh, is I will take a, a, like a font off of my you know, Word, Microsoft Word, and then I will type it out, and then I will put it, fold the paper over, and I will re-letter it over the type. And you can get some really cool effects that way, like this super scratchy, yet it's very uniform, and it's different. And it's not, you're not using that computer lettering, which I think looks very stiff, and whenever I see it as a cartoonist, I, I mean, I get mad because, I, you know, um, in some ways. But, you know, it, it makes it different. This is the new relaxed Jack Oman. I know. His, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> printing out fonts and then tracing them in his uh, free right. time. Well, no, I mean... It... <laughs> yeah. I knew it. <laughs> well, this is my 15 minutes of fame. Anyway, thank you very much. It was great to be able to spew. Thank you.